As part of our Spotlight on Magazine series, we're talking today about the recent cover issue of Wired Magazine about the National Security Agency building a new and, and the country's biggest spy center. The author of that, James Bamford, is joining us. He's the author of uh, several books on the NSA as well. I've been following the NSA for many years now. What is the Utah Data Center? Well, it's an enormous uh, warehouse, basically, where NSA is going to keep all its intercepts, all its communication that it's intercepted, whether it's phone calls or emails or uh, tweets, whatever kind of communications it picks up, it has a place to store them, and then it'll serve as what's known as a cloud. In other words, uh, agency uh, listening posts and the headquarters from different parts of the country will be able to tap into that communications that is stored there and then analyze it. Uh, so it's a, it's a big storage center for intercepted communications. Why? Why is this necessary? Well, because NSA intercepts huge amounts of uh, communications. It intercepts communications all over the world. And, um, you know, you got a lot of communications. You've got to have some place to put it. So that's why they built Utah, the Bluffdale uh, Data Center. How does this tie in with what is the role or responsibility of the NSA? Well, that's what NSA's job is. It basically has three jobs. One is intercepting communications. The other is... Uh, breaking codes, and the third is making codes for the U.S. So in order to break the code, you've got to intercept the communications, and uh, that's what NSA has been doing uh, since 1952, is uh, putting satellites in space, uh, ground stations, uh, listening posts in, in, uh, in communications facilities like AT&T, and uh, sifting through all this uh, data, whether it's a phone call or an email, looking for uh, whatever targets they're looking for. Of foreign nationals? Well, looking for whatever targets. I mean, uh, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy was a target for a while. Uh, he was on the uh, watch list. He couldn't get on airplanes without being frisked. So anybody can be a target in the United States. So there's, uh, uh, there were up to a million people on the watch list, and a lot of them are innocent people. A lot of them are there by mistakes. A lot of them are there because they said the wrong word at the wrong time or were in the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, had nothing to do with terrorism. A little history about the NSA established by President Truman on November 4th, 1952, created to conduct post-war era code breaking. As James Benford said, two missions, gather adversaries' secrets and protect U.S. national security info. On the missions, gather adversaries' secrets. But you write in the lead graph on the cover of this magazine that American citizens need to be watching what they're saying. So are they spying on Americans? Well, certainly, yeah. Uh... That was the whole controversy over the uh, warrantless eavesdropping program under President Bush. It was uh, eavesdropping on Americans. The NSA was formed, like the Marines or other uh, organizations that are formed uh, for foreign wars, it was formed to eavesdrop outside the United States. The Marines aren't used to, you know, police the streets of the United States. Uh, and the NSA wasn't used to police the uh, uh, electronic environment of the United States, eavesdrop on U.S. citizens. It was designed to eavesdrop on foreign countries, foreign governments, and foreign people. Uh, so this is a big change. NSA is switching to eavesdrop on, on Americans. It, was, it did that in the Nixon administration. It uh, violated the law back then. It violated the law when it was first created. Uh, for 30 years, it eavesdropped illegally on, uh, on U.S. communications until it was discovered in 1975. So it's had a history of eavesdropping illegally on, on U.S. citizens and then lying about it, saying that we aren't doing it when in reality they are doing it. So are, are you saying, according to your sources, this Utah, Utah data center that they're building, which won't be ready but until 2013, what they're going to be doing, getting people's Google searches, emails, uh, telephone calls, et cetera, that that's illegal? Well, there's a law. It's called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendments Act, and that just determines what's legal and illegal, but NSA has its own um, internal guidelines on what it can do, which is top secret. And so its definition of words, uh, such as intercept, is not the Webster's Dictionary uh, definition. Their definition of intercept, you can pull all this information in, but it's not technically intercepted until you actually listen to it. So um, there's a problem of definitions. There's a problem of uh, truth-telling a lot of times with NSA, and there's a problem of... Uh, the capability to intercept so much information at uh, all times. The NSA chief was asked about your story specifically and what you wrote and, and on the issue of American citizens. I want to show that moment in a congressional hearing uh, just last month. 
Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. What judicial consent is required for NSA to intercept communications and information involving American citizens? Within the United States, that would be the FBI lead. If it was a foreign actor in the United States, the FBI would still have to lead and could work that with, the, with NSA or other intelligence agencies as authorized. But to conduct that kind of, of collection in the United States, it would have to go through a court order and the court would have to authorize it. We are not authorized to do it, nor do we do it. James Bamford, what do you make of his reaction? Well, again, uh, the, the term was interception, and NSA has its top secret definition of what interception means. And if you remember, just a few years ago, uh, President Bush was asked whether the NSA intercepts communications, and he said no. At the very same time, they were conducting the warrantless eavesdropping operation. Uh, they asked the uh, officials uh, back in the uh, 70s about it, and they denied uh, doing it when they'd been doing it for 30 years. So the problem is that NSA doesn't have really much accountability. Um, there is very few times the NSA director is actually asked to testify. This is just a off the hand, uh, off the uh, uh, sort of offhand comment that uh, was made by one congressman who happened to ask one question. And I think there really has to be a a really good uh, congressional investigation on what NSA's capabilities are, what it can do, and what it does do. So why is the Utah Data Center necessary? I mean, why, why are they building it there in Utah? Well, they're building it there. Uh, I think uh, Senator Orrin Hatch had a lot to do with it. He was chairman of the um, Senate Intelligence Committee for quite a while, and a um, very powerful senator. Plus, it's a, they've got the area. It's a very big uh, area of this Camp Williams where they're building it. It's a, a very open um, uh, military base in Utah. And also, I think the cost of electricity is cheaper there than it is, certainly than it is in Maryland, where their headquarters is, and a lot of other places in the country. So there's a variety of reasons of why they put it there. It should be ready in 2013. The cost, $2 billion. How much will it cost, just to, to build it, $2 billion. How much will it cost to run it? You mentioned electricity. Yeah, it... Uh, It'll probably be, I think, $40, $40 million a year or something like that to, uh, to run it. It's hard to, to say how much, uh, uh, how much exactly, but somewhere around there, somebody estimated. And why is that such an expensive cost? I mean, what's going on in there that the electricity cost is that high? Well, you need to uh, several things. You need all these servers in there to store all the data. Uh, and then the, one of the big costs is the cooling. You have to cool all these computers and all this... Uh, uh, all these servers, all these uh, um, uh, technolo uh, technological devices in there, you need to cool them, and that takes a lot of uh, uh, electricity to run the cooling uh, machines, the air conditioning. You mentioned computers. A special supercomputer was built for the Utah Data Center. Talk about that. Well, uh, as I said, one of the NSA's jobs is code breaking. A lot of the information NSA is going to pick up to put into that center will be encrypted information. It'll be foreign encrypted, such as uh, foreign military, diplomatic, and U.S. Uh, encryption. There's a lot of uh, communications people send every day, whether it's you're buying a book from Amazon or whatever it is, you're sending credit card information, all that's encrypted. Personal information is encrypted. Legal information, a lot of times, is encrypted. So um, there's a lot of encrypted information. And in order to break a code, uh, there's two really, uh, real, two things that you really need more than anything else. You need a lot of data. You can't break a code if you have like one message or two. You need to see patterns. So if you have 200,000 messages, it's much easier to see patterns in that. And then you need a computer that's going to look for those patterns and sift through all these combinations. It's called brute force. And they need a computer that will do it very, very quickly. And that's what they're building is the world's fastest computer down and in uh, uh, Tennessee, the same place they built the um, uh, the atomic bomb in World War II. And how fast is this computer? Well, it operates at what's known as petaflop uh, speeds, which is, uh, uh, I think it's a quadrillion operations a second. 
So um, there are somewhere around 10 uh, petaflops now, so 10 quadrillion operations a second, and they're trying to advance it a thousand fold to a, a zettaflop, I think it is, which will be, I don't even know what that number right. is, so it's very fast. I mean, you talk about the amount of data going through uh, when you talk about peop everybody's emails and Google searches and all that. I mean, uh, some of the, the terms that you throw out there, I don't know people have even heard of before when it comes to people for megabytes and gigabytes, but how many bytes are we talking about of data? Well, I mentioned Yoda bytes. Yeah. Yoda byte is the highest. Uh, they haven't created a, a term beyond Yoda bytes yet. Uh, uh, Yoda byte is, if you translate it into pages, it would be about 500 quintillion pages of uh, text. And um, you can store an awful lot of information in a building that's, uh, or in a facility that's going to be a million square feet. Uh, when you figure you could put a uh, terabyte, I've seen on uh, Swiss Army knives now, they have a, a blade that's actually a... Uh, uh, um, a terabyte of data. So uh, you can put an awful lot of data in a, uh, in a building the size of uh, the NSA data center in Utah. You, here's a graphic in your piece with a, a look at uh, the, the center and what will be in there. It will encompass one million square feet. Who will work there and how many? Well, there won't, uh, actually building it is uh, where most of the jobs come in. There'll be about uh, 10,000 jobs in, in terms of building this, uh, this thing for several years. Uh, contractors. Contractors, yeah. And, and then uh, actually working in the facility, uh, there'll only be maybe 200 at the most because it's just baby, basically babysitting the, uh, uh, the electronics, uh, making sure everything's working. If uh, something goes out, replacing it. But the actual analysis will be done Externally, it'll be done at NSA headquarters or NSA listening posts via uh, uh, secure fiber optic links. This data center is top secret, what they do. The contractors uh, had to be sworn to secrecy to, in order to get this bid. You talk about the groundbreaking ceremony where Senator Hatch and local authorities were there and said, well, we're breaking ground here, but we can't tell you what, what's going to be going on. So how did you get this information? Well, I've been writing about NSA for actually 30 years. My first book on NSA, The Puzzle Palace, came out in 1982. So and I've done three books on NSA and numerous articles on NSA. So I've been following it for many, many years. Um, so I've developed a great number of sources on NSA over the years. And one of my key sources for this article, actually the, the most senior uh, official I've ever interviewed who's gone on the record, is Bill Benny. He was a... Um, a very, very senior official who was basically the person who uh, uh, designed the entire worldwide eavesdropping network for NSA. He, he automated the worldwide e eavesdropping network for NSA. And uh, he left NSA uh, soon after NSA began illegally eavesdropping on Americans. He'd been there almost 40 years. And then he couldn't be there while they were doing what he considered illegal, illegal eavesdropping. So he left and he told me that uh, we explained basically how NSA was doing all this eavesdropping and then uh, uh, where it was doing it from and, and the methods and how many, uh, I think he said uh, uh, there were uh, it was something like uh, 320 million calls a day they were intercepting. So uh, he, he explained the uh, enormous capability of NSA and, uh, and he said at the end, uh, you know, we're this far away, he put his two fingers together and about an inch apart and said, we're this far away from a turnkey totalitarian state. This is from somebody who was a senior official, the equivalent of a general at NSA, uh, had been there for nearly 40 years. James Banford, investigative reporter, wrote the piece for Wired magazine. As he said, an author on the NSA's most recent book, The Shadow Factory, the ultra-secret NSA from 9-11 to the eavesdropping on America. Let's get to phone calls here. Robin is first. She's a Republican in New Haven, Michigan. Go ahead, Robin. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have several comments to make. I hope I can get them all out. Um, I remember 15, 20 years ago hearing about this big mega computer system that they had in Belgium. I think this one will put um, the Belgium one to shame. The other comment I have is that, uh, going back to Hitler's time, the people that became IBM had a tracking and tracing system, and that was how they were able to round up all the Jews. And I think this is uh, an outrage. And I mean, you had General Petraeus coming out saying that they're going to be putting uh, tracking devices in our appliances, our microwaves, our dishwashers. 
I mean, our phones. I mean, there's no escaping it. There's cameras on every corner. Everything we do. We live in the biggest police state. I mean, it's just incredible what okay. our country has become. Oh, it's a oh. tyrannical, overpowering system. All right, Robin, so what about that sentiment, Mr. Bamford? Is she accurate? Well, I think there is a, uh, the, the problem today is that you do have all this technology out there, and there's very few people that are, are saying no to it. There's very few congressional hearings on uh, where we're going in terms of uh, surveillance, and I think it is a uh, cross-party issue. I think Republicans, uh, Libertarians, and, and uh, Liberals are all um, concerned about this issue um, because... 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you couldn't do that. The, the only way people communicated were, was either a rug or telephone and hanging in your kitchen uh, that was attached uh, by a wire, or uh, the mail, and the mail was uh, sacrosanct. You couldn't open the mail. There, there was just no scandals of illegally opening mail. And today, everybody communicates by uh, email, uh, which is available to NSA. The, it, they talk on cell phones as you're driving down the street, you send tweets, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, you go on Facebook, you look on Google, you do page searches. So you can pretty much, you watch a person for about a week or two, you can pretty much uh, get that person's life uh, down pat uh, by watching their electronic footprint for about a week. What about, though, uh, it, that might, information might not tell you much. What about the encrypted information, and how easy is it to get that information if you, uh, to get into people's, data on their disks or on their hard drives. I mean, explain that process. Well, if it's encrypted, it's much more difficult to get in. What NSA or and other agencies, the FBI, for example, uh, would try to do first, if they could, is to try to find your password, which there are various programs you can put out to find the password, and then you can get in, then you don't have to do the what's known as brute force. Uh, they would do that mostly on, uh, on a, a large-scale encryption um, that they would want to get the entire uh, network and how, how it works. But they would always try to uh, subvert somebody in a foreign um, um, country that works on computers or works in the network to try to get the information. Um, but it is much more difficult, obviously, if it's encrypted. The problem is with encryption is uh, you can buy some encryption, but to a large degree you have to have the person you're communicating with also have the encryption. You can't send an encrypted message to somebody who doesn't have it or they won't be able to read it. Mm -hmm. And so um, how good uh, is the United States on breaking encrypted code? Well, it's hard to say. It's, again, one of the NSA's biggest secrets. But, you know, during World War II, the Germans thought they had the world's most secure communications system, the Enigma machine, and, and the British with American help was able to break, break it. Uh, same with the Japanese uh, purple code, the... Uh, very sophisticated code, the NSA, or actually predecessor NSA, was able to break that encryption during World War II. And, and uh, so it's, much, it's very, very difficult to break codes, but that's what NSA's job is, is to break codes. So and, obviously they do it. Yeah, and that's what JKL on, on Twitter wants to know. The NSA is the world's largest user of data storage. Storage server companies are making bank. Is that true? The NSA is the world's largest user of data storage? Um, I, you know, I can't say that uh, accurately. I would think that they, they certainly are up there in the top uh, few. I mean, Google probably stores a lot. Um, there's probably a, a lot for Facebook or whatever. But NSA probably pulls in more. Well, obviously, NSA intercepts more communication than any place else, and it's got to have a place to store it. So uh, I'd say it's probably accurate. The uh, Wired Magazine story inside James Bamford piece in secret listening rooms nationwide. NSA software examines every email, phone, call, and tweet as they zip by. Chris, Democratic caller, New Haven, Connecticut. Hi. Thanks for taking my call and thanks for C SPAN. Um, I find it really interesting, Mr. Bamford. You do really good work. Um, but Thank you. you focus so much at the early part of the article on the history of the area where this center is. And you focused a lot on the polygamy that was originally there. And I'm wondering if you're implying that there's an alien mindset here that's different from most Americans that allows these people to trample our civil rights. And basically, as that man said, is basically, I forget what the term you said, you know, using his fingers apart this far apart from, oh, it's a totalitarian state. All right, let's get a response, Mr. Bamford. 
Yeah, I mean, the, what was very interesting when I was looking into where they were building this data center um, is they built it in this uh, uh, little town of Bluffdale, uh, Utah. And um, the only other thing that I found of note in Bluffdale was the fact that it was also home to the uh, second largest uh, um, sect of polygamists in the country. So I thought it was very interesting. I just uh, had two paragraphs there sort of uh, looking at this uh, a uh, combination of the secret of NSA people coming into this little town and they're listening for these uh, encrypted messages from space and, and then you have the uh, polygamists in there also who were um, listening for messages from space to some degree or from the heavens. And uh, they're both fairly secretive groups because polygamy is uh, legal in the United States. So um, it was very interesting that you had this secretive group of eavesdroppers uh, sharing the same little town with, uh, with this second largest sect of polygamists in the country. And it was, uh, the town uh, even had to expand its boundaries uh, to, to incorporate the entire uh, facility, the million square foot uh, NSA facility. So it is a very interesting little um, uh, uh, note that the uh, two groups there are uh, cohabiting, uh, cohabiting the same little town. Port Orange, Florida. Philip, independent caller. Talking about polygamy, let me just say this. The, the two-party system is married to the military-industrial complex, James. And I, I recommend for all those listening that the best book you wrote was Body of Secrets. It's one of the greatest books I ever read. I'm an activist. Uh, I've been out there uh, working with the 25%. It's called 25 Cent Solution. And uh, our goal is to get the military spending cut by tw 25% and send the money back, you know, to the cities and states to, to help uh, save jobs and to, to rebuild the economy. Uh, what the people don't realize uh, is that 56 cents out of every federal tax dollar that you and I and the young lady send to the federal government last year goes for military spending, which I'm sure part of is for this whole complex that you're talking about. Uh, 56 cents out of every dollar, it's outrageous. All right, Philip, so uh, do we know what the NSA's overall budget is every year and how many employees they have? Well, it's all secret, but uh, the budget is enormous. It's uh, probably the largest intelligence budget in the country. It's, NSA is about three times the size of uh, the CIA. and, and uh, um, In terms of personnel, it's probably about three times the size also. It's uh, hard to say, somewhere 30, 40,000 people, something like that. But it is a extremely expensive agency because uh, it has so much hardware and it has satellites and it has people all over the world. And, and uh, um, in the article, uh, the Wired Magazine article, uh, I write the, um, I show all this new building that NSA has been going on in the last 10 years. They're building new li listing posts in Georgia, in Texas, in uh, Colorado, in uh, Hawaii, uh, putting new satellites up, uh, um, putting new uh, uh, dishes in uh, their listing post in, in England. Uh, so it's in their uh, headquarters are spending another two, two to three billion dollars on expanding its headquarters. So, um, um, and then you've got the new supercomputer facilities down in uh, uh, Tennessee. So it's an enormous building pro uh, program. And I agree that with the caller that there's uh, far too much uh, military spending and uh, it's this in, uh, Eisenhower warned of the industrial, military industrial complex. Now it's the uh, intelligence, security, and military industrial complex that's uh, gog gobbling up so much uh, money when uh, we could be spending it for things much more usefully in the United States. One other point is the fact that it would be good if, uh, if all this money was useful, usefully spent. But, you know, NSA uh, uh, missed the first World Trade Center uh, attack. It missed the attack on the USS Cole. It missed the attacks on the East African embassies. It missed the attack on 9/11. It missed the attacks on, uh, or missed the um, uh, the uh, underwear bomber who flew into uh, Detroit on Christmas Day, and he missed. They missed the uh, the Times Square bomber. So, you know, if you got something for all that money, um, it, it might be uh, a different story. But the point is, they spend, spend, spend all this money, and they collect so much information. Uh, it's not a lack of information that they have. It's too much information that they collect. Supporters of NSA, though, might say, we don't know how many they have caught, though. I mean, you're, you're pointing out the, the, what they haven't been able to catch, but 
perhaps we do, we have no idea because it's top secret how, how many other times they're catching. Well, I've interviewed a lot attacks. of sources at NSA, you know, including Bill Penny. Uh, I, I think uh, I would have found out if there was some massive uh, terrorist operation that they stopped, and I've never heard of one yet. Boring file clerk on Twitter. NSA is infringing on freedom of speech and of association. What constitutional authority grants them this power? Well, they have this. Uh, uh, well, let me back up for a second. NSA is a very unusual agency. It's extremely unusual. Every other agency in the U.S. government was formed in Congress. Uh, there were uh, bills creating an agency. There were hearings on whether it should have one. The CIA was created that way. There was a bill put before Congress. They debated it. Uh, it was created in law. NSA isn't like that. NSA was never created in law. It was created by a secret, it's actually a top secret memorandum signed by Harry Truman in 1952. It was created in absolute secrecy. Congress wasn't even allowed to know about it. Even its name was supposed to be secret for, for years until it began leaking out. So uh, NSA was created in an in a enormously secret uh, method, uh, unlike any other agency. And since then, it has uh, lived in this very unique world where uh, very few people are ever allowed to ask questions about it. The director hardly ever speaks in public uh, before Congress or, or anything. So it's a agency has very little accountability. The only law in terms of NSA's eavesdropping is this law called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendments Act, which actually watered down the original uh, uh, law, which was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act created in 1978. And that put this uh, court, it was a very secret court called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, between the NSA and the public. So if NSA wanted to eavesdrop on a US citizen, it had to go to the court. And that's what the Bush administration bypassed uh, and broke the law by doing that. And then after that, the, the law was watered down to water down the uh, effectiveness and the, uh, uh, the role of the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in NSA's eavesdropping. John, a Republican, St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, John, you're Hello. on the air. Hi. Uh, I have a member of my not immediate family, just a more or less distant relative who is a high-ranking officer in Air Force intelligence, and he has to be vetted every year. And they ask him repeatedly uh, why my two sons married foreign nationals, one from Germany and the other from Spain, which are our allies, I was told. And then the other questions get even more interesting. I, my hobby is paintball war games. I'm active on the internet forums, and I frequently use terms like RPG, law, tank, silencer, etc. And they ask him about my political leanings in great detail, my attitudes towards the government in great detail. And, you know, if you want to connect the dots, it's because Big Brother is listening. Mr. Bamford. Well, um, you know, that's the problem is you're uh, an innocent citizen has never done anything wrong. And uh, your uh, comments could be taken completely out of context. And that's how you get a million people on the watch list. And that's how you get so many innocent people. And, you know, it's not a problem of uh, just being thrown off an airplane. You may not even be on the list that uh, is a no-fly list, but you could be on the NSA blacklist, which means that if you uh, secretly somehow, uh, or, or uh, uh, if you had, say, a, a relative or a son that wants to go to the, uh, um, one of the service academies, they may not get in because they see that you, uh, from these uh, mistaken intercepts that they're getting, um, indicate that you're not a loyal American citizen or you're applying for a small business loan and you don't get it, you may not know why, but it may be because you're on this secret blacklist, this watch list that NSA has. So those are some of the dangers, and that's why when people say, well, I never do anything wrong, so why should I care about it? That's why you should care about it, because there's a million people, and who knows how many more may be on there that uh, never did anything wrong, but they're on there, and they're not going to send you a letter in the mail saying, oh, you're on the, the watch list, you're just not going to get that loan you applied for, or somebody, as this gentleman just uh, mentioned, uh, going to be questioned because they, they mistakenly think that the person's involved in terrorism or something. How is it that the NSA is getting this information? 
out of, uh, how is it that they're getting it? I mean, what is the role of telecommunications companies, AT&T, Verizon, Google? Are they allowing NSA to tap? They are. They've been doing it uh, uh, ever since NSA was created in 1952. Actually, if you want to go back to the predecessor to NSA in 1946, uh, the telecommunications have always uh, known it was illegal to help these agencies do it, and they've always gone along and done it. And just this last time was uh, the warrantless eavesdropping during the Bush administration. Once again, AT&T and the other companies uh, uh, just saluted smartly and did whatever NSA asked them to do, regardless of the fact that it was a violation of the law. And um, they suffered no penalties uh, for it because Congress passed a law saying uh, they can't be prosecuted and they can't even be sued. Uh, they gave them total immunity for, for what happened. So there's really no incentive for these companies to obey the law. And if you get a, another president like Bush or Nixon who comes in and says, uh, uh, and Nixon used it largely for uh, a lot of times for political reasons also. So um, that's the problem. If you have uh, uh, give immunity to these companies for violating the law, then the next president come along can use it to uh, subvert his uh, his political opponent or to use it for uh, nefarious ways as the Nixon administration did. Gracie on Twitter, what would happen if we got rid of the NSA, defund them, fire them? What would happen? Well, I don't know. It would be an interesting question. Um, I, uh, I'm not a supporter of doing away with the NSA, but I am uh, in favor of putting the NSA on a leash so that they can't get away from do, get away with doing what they did during the Bush administration or, or, or operate in absolute secrecy in a democracy. So um, I would like to see some compromise where NSA uh, uh, gets the funding it needs but doesn't get the funding that, that uh, is so excessive that it's getting now. And, and with no questions asked. The Congress asks no questions of NSA. And at the end of uh, not this article but the next article I wrote about NSA, uh, you know, I said, who's listening to the listeners? And that's the problem. Uh, nobody's really paying attention to the people who are doing the eavesdropping. Do the intelligence committees up on Capitol Hill, Hill have oversight of NSA? Well, they do. But the problem is, uh, well, the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee uh, do. But the role has shifted. In, in the, when these, agents, or these uh, uh, committees were created around the mid-'70s under Senator Frank Church, for example, the first Senate Intelligence Committee, he was very aggressive in, in uh, taking on his role as protecting the American public from these agencies. And he did an enormous search. That's how they first found out that NSA had been illegally eavesdropping for 30 years. Um, but since that time, Congress has shifted its, its uh, role pretty much. And now it's basically a, uh, a cheering squad for the NSA. If an administration isn't giving the intelligence community uh, enough money, they're lobbying for more money going to the uh, 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 NSA. So it's a, uh, a complete switch from, from this hard oversight to a uh, lackadaisical, well, uh, we can't say anything about NSA and they can do whatever they want attitude. James Bamford, who writes uh, many books about the NSA, wrote the Wired cover piece. Inside of uh, the piece, he writes, once it's operational, this Utah data center, which comes with a price tag of $2 billion for construction, will become, in effect, the NSA's cloud. The center will be fed data collected by the agency's eavesdropping satellites, overseas listening posts, and secret monitoring rooms and telecom facilities throughout the U.S. All that data will then be accessible to the NSA's code breakers, data miners, China uh, analysts, counterterrorism specialists, and others working at its Fort Meade headquarters and around the world. Georgie, Democratic caller in California. Morning. Good morning. Um I've always found this interesting, and, and uh, with my age, I've always known that they've been doing this. But now they're doing it where people are actually getting arrested for things they've done five years ago. And, and it's been things they've said on their cell phone. And, they're, you know, so that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in California. And in Los Angeles, it's going to set a precedent. If it hasn't already been said, I don't know if it's already been said or not. But if anything you say on your cell phone, you get red flagged, and people know they're red flagged. And but then there's so many that don't, and they find themselves behind bars 
five years later for something they said five years ago. You know, so it, 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 to me, it's absolutely insane. We've lost this country. The people, the citizens of this country need to take this country back and make it a democracy. All right. Chris, a Republican in Las Vegas. Thank you for your work, Mr. Bamford. I appreciate as, it. Thank you. As one who also connect dots out here, I have found that this Utah Center seems to be the crowning jewel of what was originally inspired under 10 U.S.C. 2358, the Strom Thurmond NDE, NDAA Act of 1961. And I find it likely that there's an incorporative quality of it that interfaces it with the smart meters through the smart grid system that enables those two-way transmitters on your home to create a virtual wired prison via the wires in your home that you can't see and possibly the introduction of mind-altering psychoelectronic waves into your home via the subcarrier on the 60 cycle AC frequency. All right, that was Chris in Las Vegas. We'll hear from Kareen in Independent in Dallas. Yes, hi. Morning. Uh, good morning. Hope everyone is well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bamford, uh, my question to you is that you mentioned that um, Congress needs to launch an investigation into the, I feel, early illegal tactics of what the NSA are doing. But how is that possible when Congress are pretty much allowing and, you know, passing legislation to allow the NSA to do what they're able to do? Mr. Bamford? Well, all those questions are very good. And the um, uh, question that uh, the gentleman just asked, that, that's the problem. The Congress doesn't have an incentive to um, look into NSA because what the problem with uh, the Congress right now is that no Congress person ever wants to look weak on terrorism because they know that their opponent is going to say, um, um, well, you voted against this, uh, this new bill to put the data center in, uh, in Utah, which actually isn't even a bill. NSA just does it. So um, um, that's the problem. The problem is that there's too many Congress people that are not willing to, to uh, go out on a limb and say that we've got too much surveillance going on. Uh, because they're so afraid of being accused of being weak on terrorism. So anything that the administration uh, suggests or proposes or anything that NSA comes up with is okay because uh, uh, it's going to fight this war on terrorism. And, and to be opposed to it is to open yourself up to criticism from your future opponent who's going to say you're weak on, on, uh, on terrorism. And I think that's a serious problem. How you get around it, you have to have congressmen or Congress people that have uh, a lot of moral uh, fiber to stand up against these agencies. How has the Obama administration responded to the NSA? Well, it's done the same as I was just saying. Uh, they, uh, they're they very weak on the, the whole issue of uh, privacy. Uh, President Obama, when he was running for office, said uh, he was totally against uh, what NSA was doing, this illegal warrantless eavesdropping and that uh, he would vote against any expansion of NSA's power. He would even filibuster against it and he said he would vote against any immunity to the, to the uh, telecom companies that, are, that uh, illegally assisted NSA. And then when push came to shove and it uh, actually came up for a vote, he voted in favor of uh, expanding NSA's surveillance capability and he voted in favor of uh, immunity to the telecom companies. And since then, uh, uh, the uh, surveillance, uh, U.S. surveillance under Obama has uh, increased uh, enormously from the Bush years. I mean, now they're talking about drones flying over the United States, collecting pictures and eavesdropping. And uh, uh, as a uh, few people have mentioned, uh, General Petraeus, the new head of the CIA, came out a few days ago, or last week, I guess, a couple weeks ago, maybe, saying that uh, uh, there's all these... Uh, uh, connections now to people's electronics in their houses, their dishwasher, their, uh, uh, their electronic uh, components and everything, and that the um, uh, CIA feels it's, uh, it, it has a responsibility to monitor these things. <laughs> you know, nobody's saying stop. Everybody's just saying, uh-oh, war on terrorism, we better let them do whatever they want to do. Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Clay, Democratic caller. 
Uh, thank you very much, C-SPAN, Greta, and thank you, Mr. Baffert. I thoroughly enjoy your books, uh, Puzzle Palace and Body of Secrets. Uh, I have a question for you. In 2008, I had attended the conference where Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Gary Ruff had spoke about the 10th Fleet. As you well know, I think uh, the 10th Fleet is a reinvigoration from the FDR era of uh, anti-submarine uh, sweeping by American forces. I believe there was about 50 at the time. However, as I understand it, the 10th Fleet is now going to incorporate an additional 44,000 employees on top of, uh, I believe, 13,000 employees for intelligence gathering, specifically electronic eavesdropping. I'd like to know if you've heard of this, uh, about this program, and by the way, some of these uh, directors, the president it was a former NSA director, um, that Mr. some of these programs, what, what their budget is, and what they're tasked for. I would be uh, very much like to hear your uh, comments on this. Thank you very much. Well, it's a good question. The, uh, uh, it's expanded enormously. There is this uh, entire fleet now of, uh, uh, of cyber warriors. Uh, that's the new war. Is, um, uh, we're creating an enormous, uh, uh, you know, you're always looking for new wars out there, and uh, now they're latching on to cyber war is the, is the latest thing. Uh, these contractors, these, uh, you know, contractors out there, they need some place to make money, and uh, they're making lots of money on, uh, on these uh, cyber wars. And as you mentioned, there's a, a, a new fleet. The fleet is uh, just going to be made up of eavesdroppers and uh, cyber warriors. James Ramford, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Thank you for your time this morning. Appreciate it, Greta. The piece is the April edition of Wired magazine about the NSA's uh, biggest spy center, building the country's biggest spy center. Thank you. Appreciate it.